here. Okay. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Is everyone feeling happy to be stood out here in the cold? <laughs> yeah, we love it, don't we? Hi, everyone. Um, I was actually wanting to come and speak about the neglect of the um, issue about the sexual violence that was very much part of a, a tactic of war that um, went on in the recent terrible terrorism in Israel and then compounding that, um, the gaslighting of the entire world about it. Um, so I'm just going to quickly give credit to the people that are marching today in support of Israel. Then I wanted to talk about Rosie Duffield, who we find out this morning has been told that she's not going to be able to stand as a Labour MP in her very marginal constituency. She was the first person ever to win it from the Tories. She's the only Labour MP in Kent. And then I thought, well, maybe I should talk about the, the man in the blue dress because um, we still have got a lot to talk about. And uh, this has been called the AGP gate by some people. And it relates to a man who came to a conference run by Genspect in Denver, wearing what could only be described as his little sister's prom dress, um, which was blue velvet, which he combined with some football socks, some blue trainers and some what looked to me like football socks with the ends cut off that made like arm warmers. I mean, you know, human sexuality is incredibly varied, is all I can say, because that was, as a combination, it works for him and nobody else on the planet. But that <laughs> is the purpose of autogynophilia, which is a sexual fetish which these men struggle with because they do, they do struggle with it, it seems. It seems that it is so compelling, these unusual ideas and drives. A fetish is any sexual compulsion that isn't about a partner and perhaps partner's characteristics and perhaps partner's secondary sexual characteristics, but is about either an inanimate object or a part of the body that isn't a secondary sexual characteristic or a consenting partner, perhaps they are a baby, Perhaps they are an animal, perhaps they are a disembodied foot, perhaps they are a rubber balloon. Um, but there are many and varied of these fetishes and tend to group together. People that develop one have already wired their brains in a funny way and it can jump onto other things as well. So you will find them grouping together, the people that like men. hurting men. 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 People. men. You are correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So overwhelmingly these are men there are very 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 few women who develop specific unusual ideas but it is by and large a huge majority of men that that have this and it will group together so one will encourage the development of another so you might start out a sadist and then you might start thinking i like inflicting pain i'm going to inflict pain on adult partners and then you might decide to inflict pain on animal partners and then you might decide you like inflicting pain on human children um, and you will become more and more degenerate as your your very soul is destroyed as the compulsions take over your life so what we've done as a society by enabling autogynophilia is actually incredibly dangerous first of all for the men themselves who are going down a path going down a rabbit hole towards absolute degeneration as a as a human where there are no limits to the levels of perversion the levels of degeneracy that they will experience their next victims are the people in the closest contact to them which are their wives and their children because most of these men develop these fetishes over quite a long period of time and it becomes public after a period of many years of escalation. During that time, they may have ex exposed their family members, their wives, their children to escalating levels of coercive control, sexual and physical abuse within the home, which may have been hidden to the rest of the world for many years. 
but we see you. We see what you're doing. And we can name it as male violence, part of the continuum of male violence. This is a, a thing that feminism has recently become particularly concerned about because transsexuality or transgenderism used to be something that was more confined to a very small subset of men. Um, and now it has exploded. And most of these men are now heterosexual, middle-aged men whose fetishes have overwhelmed their entire lives. And their entire life is now devoted to the fetish. There is nothing else. It's like it's hollowed out their entire personality. There's nothing left. Anyway, so the point of this is to say that when a man is exhibiting a fetish in a public place, he is showing a dangerous escalation in that fetish. It has gone beyond something he's experiencing in his head. It's gone beyond something that he's looking for online. It's gone beyond something that he's experiencing in his head, looking for online, and perhaps he's talking to another person that's on the same journey. And then it's gone beyond that into perhaps exposing his wife and his children to it. And then it's gone beyond that into meeting up in real life with other men that share the same fetish that are also abusing their wives and children and are looking online for more victims. So you can see that by the time they're coming out into public and sharing that with they are 50 steps down the road. It is not something that is innocent. It is not something that is harmless. We are all harmed by this. My children are harmed by this. Your children are harmed by this. We are harmed by it. They're harmed by it too, and so are their wives and children, but we are all being harmed by it by the time they are in public. Mandated reporters, safeguarders, people who are responsible for the mental health of other people must be aware of this. All of us must be aware of it. There are no excuses. This is basic safeguarding. If a man was to walk into a room where I had a bunch of people who were very vulnerable, perhaps they'd been abused in a medical setting, perhaps they'd managed to claw their way out of that. Perhaps there's a room with women who've experienced domestic violence, coercive control, people that are vulnerable in different ways with experiences of male violence and a man like that walks into the room, what do you think my responsibility is to those people? And my responsibility is to reduce the harm to those people in that room. My responsibility is to remove the harmful element from that room. And anything less than that is a disgusting failure of responsibility. It's a failure in safeguarding and shame on you to anyone that fails to safeguard people that they are responsible for. That's it. All right. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? We keep getting like harmless. I mean, these men in schools and everyone's like, oh, it's, it's a stunning brave. It's a special kind of trick, isn't it? Or rather, it's a special kind of failure that no matter how many times massive, great big scandals come and show themselves and we're all going, oh, well, how, how could that have happened? And those same people that ask those questions basically do the same. And it happens again, and 10 years later, people ask of them, how did you let it happen? Well, you let it happen by staying quiet, minimizing, so much minimizing goes along, goes on all the time. When I was in that uh, conversation with those teachers, <laughs> I can't tell you, there's sort of, one of the women, I can't even show you because otherwise I'd have to reveal my eyes. But one of the women just like sat there and when I said, what did I say? I said something about harm. Um, would, you, would you make her use the pronouns or something? And she sort of rolled her eyes. I, I highlighted some sort of safeguarding thing and she rolled her eyes. And I was talking to a friend, a male friend, and I said to him, you know, these teachers are so captured. Like, you know, are they frightened going along with it? And he goes, no, 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 they hold you in complete contempt. They think you're wrong. So those people going along with it in schools, they're not just captured, 
They think you're wrong. They think you're making a fuss about nothing. They think you're a little bit backward. They, they, they think, like, how dare you come in and question them and their relationship with your children? Who do you think you are? And I think that once that kind of... And I'm so thankful that happened before I went in the meeting because I was kind of thinking that some of these teachers are victims. And then by the time I got to the meeting, I was feeling like, fuck it, I really don't think these teachers are victims. I think, actually, if you go along with it, even if in your private conversations you admit that it's wrong, if you still go along with it, then you are holding those children in contempt. You are actually saying that even though you know it's wrong, you're still happy to do it, to get through your day, big for you, like great for you. You get to get to the end of your day and at the same time, you get to impart this despicable, lying, dishonest, vile ideology onto children. And I've seen on Twitter over the last, like since um, Wankgate, because um, let's face it, that's what he was doing. Um, since that, since that sort of discussion, I've seen so many women going, I thought his dress was nice. Like even women that dare to call them GC, and I, I, gender criti critical for me is a really pants concept. Because it means that you, that you accept that there is a notion of gender which is somehow innate, which is how it's propagated now, as opposed to gender roles, which is when, which is how feminists of old used to use it. They used to talk about what we were expected to do as women was a gender role, not that we had, we sort of grew into some sort of gender. It's just the expectations, an external thing, and now gender is fed to everybody like it's an internal thing. So when these women so-called gender critical, so-called know what a bloke is, women, start going, well, I thought he looked quite nice. Or other appeasing things, like Debbie, I've met Debbie, and he knows he's a man. Really? Is that why he calls himself Debbie? Is that why he still takes oestrogen to have fake... I mean, he claims that he hasn't had surgery, I don't know. But he claims that these, he calls his breasts natural breasts. So he calls himself Debbie, he wears clothing in order to force people that he meets on a daily basis to interact with him as if they think he's also a woman or deserves the respect or the pronouns or whatever as a woman. So don't tell me that, that these AGPs, oh they know they're a man, well then why are they dressed like that? Why are they behaving like that? Why are they trying to, this is what grooming is. like. Every single bad thing doesn't start with a massive explosion. It builds up. It brings you in. It, may, it encroaches upon your boundaries. These AGPs in their home, they don't, their wives don't get home one day and they're in full women's clothing and underwear. It starts off with, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to paint my nails. What do you think? And the wife goes, oh, I don't really like it, actually. I find it uncomfortable. Oh, no, I'm only, I'm only going to just try it just once. It's, it's quite fun, isn't it? week later still wearing the nail varnish i'm just going to put a tiny bit of eye makeup on i'm uncomfortable that's all right it's, it doesn't mean anything it's fine it's fun it's just a bit of fun it's just that you'll get used to it and then those men are then before you know it there's two thousand selfies of them in women's underwear on the bed on their own and then their wives are involved in that and then they force their wives the final act of humiliation for those wives the big crunch is when they force their wives to go out with them when they're wearing their fet fetish gear. So that's the next level of, es when you talk about escalation, that's what they do. And then by that point, their wives have no, they've lost everything. They're coercively controlled and they've got no way out of this. And if they're lucky, those men haven't tried to enforce their teenage daughters into the fantasy by asking about sharing tampons sanitary towels, what it feels like to have developing breasts. And let's face it, the, a lot of these men come out when their wives are pregnant or when their daughters hit puberty. These are kind of, these are times where these men just can't bear the fact that anybody else has more attention than them. So they have to join in. They don't know what they've come for. Um,